Today I'd like to talk to you about the concept of deep layer change in history. Uh, first I'll present a rationale for using it as a theme in history courses and as a teaching strategy. And then uh, that'll be followed by an explanation of the concept itself. And finally I'll demonstrate a diagram that uh, can be used with students in the classroom to help them visualize and better understand the concept. So first of all a little bit about the history of, of the concept itself. Uh, it originated in France in the late 1920s at Strasbourg University with the founding of the journal Annales d'Histoire Économique et Sociale by historians Marc Bloch, Lucien Febre, and Ferdinand Braudel, among others. Uh, the development of this concept was in itself a deep layered intellectual change that took place over many years, partially as a rejection of the strict materialist analysis in favor of one that emphasized the importance of cultural and psychological elements of transformative nature over long periods of time, or what the French historians call le long durée. Uh, despite this rejection of a strict materialist uh, point of view, however, I think the concept is not really not necessarily at, at odds with a materialist or Marxist worldview, but that's a discussion for another time. Um, now, many texts do give a nod in the direction of this concept, but don't fully flesh it out in quite the same way as you'll see in this presentation. Um, so, for example, um, we have in Created he Equal uh, a connecting history feature which um, discusses topics as they evolve over time. Um, in Making of America by uh, Burke and Miller and Cherney, they use a model of constraint, expectations, constraints, choices, and outcomes that um, demonstrates a dynamic process of history. Uh, the text World Civilizations, the global experience, has an in-depth feature that prompts the reader to consider far-reaching implications of historical developments. And finally, uh, America Past and Present um, takes the approach that goes beyond major events that have helped to shape the nation. Um, but again, none of these approaches defines or presents change over time in the way you'll see it presented here. Uh, as well, all of these texts utilize the traditional straight timeline in their chapter chronologies. Now, the rationale behind the creation of this teaching strategy was my feeling that the traditional straight timeline was not only insufficient, but in many ways an ahistorical and therefore wrong representation of the historical narrative. The usual timeline we see uh, in virtually every conventional history text is heavily weighted um, toward limiting the historical narrative to convulsive events with specific beginning and ending dates and to the, limiting it to the actions of great leaders of high birth. Uh, this limitation also tends to alienate students of history by implying that the important changes only come through the genius of efforts of very special people or small influential groups most unlike themselves. So the role of the unnamed masses and the less well-known leaders who inspire um, them to collective action is essentially ignored uh, in this traditional timeline scenario. As a result, the timeline proffer, the straight timeline uh, proffers an artificially time-bound and therefore a historical conceptualization of human development. Uh, most of history, as we know, in point of fact, is played out over decades, centuries, millennia, uh, merging and blending uh, social, economic, political, technological, and even environmental elements uh, for which there is no beginning uh, or uh, fixed beginning or ending dates that can be easily determined. Uh, this is why historians resort to very often in their narratives uh, to words and phrases such as movement, period, or age of um, in, in their historical narratives. So this understanding is also why the preeminent historian Gary Nash at one point many years ago in a textbook letter to students uh, stated that, quote, not a single social movement or political reform could have happened without the participation of masses of individuals. Actually, this concept might be more easily understood by applying it to ourselves in a very personal way. I like to teach students uh, with a broad concept and definition of history, and that is that uh, it's not just peoples and nations that have a history, but we as individuals, our families, neighborhoods, cities, and states, all, even the workplace culture has a history. Um, so for instance, um, 
it might be best to apply this concept of deep layer change to ourselves in a very personal way. Uh, ex for example, do we really know the specific dates that we acquired our religious and political beliefs? On what day and month and year did you develop your value and ethical system? Um, in fact, um, the reason it's impossible to assign fixed dates to these phenomena is because those seminal developments were not events of any kind with a fixed beginning and ending date. Rather, they took place over a long period of time and they did not fall into our brains fully formed on a given date. Uh, we didn't receive them in the mail with a delivery certification date. Uh, we didn't pick them up at a store. Uh, you know, we didn't take them in a pill at a certain time and date. And they, our parents didn't hand them to us on a piece of paper at a fixed date either. Um, indeed, one can argue that for most of us, these are processes that are in continual motion and development and are never really uh, finished forming. Rather, they're constantly evolving um, in slow and often imperceptible ways that we ourselves may not even be aware of. So even if you've changed your beliefs and you can remember with some specificity when that happened, uh, you have to ask yourself, what were the prior events and thoughts I had that led me to that change at that date and time? In other words, our realization of the change is most likely not when the process of changing beliefs began, but rather was the culmination of a deep layered intellectual process that preceded our realization of that change. So it's not only not possible to assign fixed dates to such developments, it's also therefore not important. Uh, the concept of deep layer change actually encourages us to resist the urge to assign fixed dates and instead to look at multiple causes for that change without concerning ourselves uh, with dates except in the most approximate and broad manner. So even though human activity mostly develops slowly and imperceptibly over time, it still is recognized as by, by all as having taken place and having great historical significance. So viewing historical development through this lens at one level allows for students of history to see themselves as participants and not simply as passive observers. Uh, inclusion of deep layer change developments in our historical narrative and teaching methods, I think, offers a more complete and therefore a truer understanding of, of where we've been and where we're headed. To the extent that that is more, that is more inclusive, it's also um, a more complex, a narrative, uh, complex narrative and therefore a fuller and better explanation of the human story. Most importantly, it holds the potential of engaging rather than alienating students as the traditional timeline tends to do. In fact, as you will see, the deep layer change diagram I will show you is actually one that can be drawn by students for individual or group assignments inside or outside of class. So let's go to uh, the concept by way of some examples. Um, now, because of this format of this presentation, it's not possible for me to flesh out these examples as I normally would in a classroom uh, discussion by um, drawing out from students rather than telling them how these examples together represent all four criteria of the deep layer change. So I'll proceed with some examples and then conclude by telling you how they represent the four characteristics of deep layer change. So the first example here is, the, uh, is one that took place over millions of years, um, the evolution of hominids to homo sapiens sapiens. Um, we have the anti-war and counterculture movements of the mid-1960s and early 70s. We have the development of the new commercial market economy in the first half of the 19th century. The spread of globalization from the 1980s to the early 21st century. The evolution of the Earth's geography. Formation of the Republican Party in the mid-19th century. And finally, changing gender expectations in the late 1960s through the 1980s. So, how do these examples express deep layer change? Well, uh, number one, you'll notice that they all have only approximate beginning and ending dates, i.e., that is, there is no specific day, month, or year for them. Um, the only time frames we have are such as these uh, that are referenced are done with phrases, such as first half of the 19th century, mid-1960s, early 1970s. The second criteria or characteristic of deep layer change is that it takes place over 
either several years, decades, centuries, millennia, millions, or even billions of years. Um, the anti-war and counterculture movements, uh, perhaps a decade or so, depending on when you think they began and ended, to the billions of years that it took for the Earth to evolve out of the solar nebula. Perhaps the shortest time frame is that of the formation of the Republican Party, um, which happened within a very few years when the nation went from the tenuous sectional peace that existed between the North and the South attained by the Compromise of 1850 to the collapse of the Whig Party and the splitting of the Democrats, which then led to the formation of the Republican Party only four short years later in March of 1854. The third criteria is that a deep layered social change, uh, a deep layered change can be about any socioeconomic, political, cultural, environmental, or technological change of lasting significance. And I like to emphasize lasting significance because if it's ephemeral, then it's not deep layered. It's not a deep layered change. Uh, so for example, you'll notice the, that the examples I provided uh, widely varied, uh, were from widely varied aspects of life, from culture to the economy to politics and the environment. And of course, as I said earlier in the presentation, that you could add intellectual developments as well. Now, the fourth criteria is that deep layer change involves the masses as well as its important leaders. So um, a careful reading of the examples also reveals that all of them involve the masses, um, if we, uh, and as well as leaders. If we look more closely, uh, although the counterculture and anti-war movements are probably often considered as a leader, leaderless phenomena, uh, there were those leaders who were out front, such as Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, Joan Baez, Joni Mitchell, Tom Hayden, and others um, who provided leadership. Um, now, you might ask, well, who were the leaders in the evolution of the Earth's geography? And that, of course, would be an except, the one exception, that there weren't any leaders in, involved in that one. But certainly the masses of people were involved to the extent that they were affected by the environmental and tectonic plate movements. Um, and then finally, of course, there's the millions of years that it took for um, hominids to develop into Homo sapiens, of course, an important biological and social development. So to summarize the four criteria of deep layer change, they only have uh, approximate beginning and ending dates, no, no day, month, or year assigned. Uh, two, they can take place over several years, decades, centuries, millennia, or up to billions of years. Uh, they can be about any socioeconomic, political, cultural, environmental, or technological change. And again, add intellectual as well. And finally, they involve the masses as well as their important leaders. Now, um, to the diagram itself. First of all, all deep layer change arcs, this is what I refer to it as a deep layer change arc, uh, must have a brief title, which expresses or describes some deep layered development. So to accomplish this in a title, we'll be using such key words and phrases as, um, well, as I, as I indicated there, rise and fall, or uh, development, evolution of, you can use change in or the demise of, you might have the transition from Paleolithic hunter-gatherer to Neolithic society. You could have something like the progressive era. Or here we have the rise of a um, particular empire that you might think of. A period of the civil rights movement. Um, for grading purposes with this arc, um, if a title does not have one of these key words or phrases in it, I usually take off one of the two points that I assign to the title. Um, there are, as you will see as we go through this, you'll see that there are four points to this arc, uh, two of which you see here now, and I usually assign two points for each of the four for a total of eight. So if a student had not had one of the key words or phrases like rise and fall here, if they had just put the Roman Empire, I would take off at least one point, and they would get um, one point would remain for the title. Now, for points two and three, you have to have it stated that it's approximate. If students don't write approximate, I also take off a point. Again, I want to we want to emphasize the idea that there are no specific dates. 
So here we've got, now this description here must relate to the first part of the phrase, which is the rise. So we've got late first century BCE, Augustus Octavian defeats Mark Antony, Senate grants Octavian dictatorial powers, and the facade of the Republic is retained. Um, but they're really on the course to empire. Um, the third point of the arc is the end, uh, two, right? See, we have from and to, approximately the late fifth century common era, barbarian invasions, plague, decline in agricultural production and loss of tax revenues, etc. cetera, um, harass the empire and result in its fall. Um, now, the fourth part um, is a simple subtraction of points two and three. Now, you might ask, well, how do you subtract such fuzzy approximate date ranges as these? Well, here you do have to think of two fixed years. So with points two, three, and four, I do accept and encourage students to come up with reasonable arguments for um, different dates as well. But my example here, uh, I've chosen uh, to subtract, uh, to add 27 years with the date of Mark Anthony's, Mark, uh, with the date of Octavian's rise to power to 476, the traditional ending date of the empire, and you get 503 approximate total years. Again, at each point, two, three, and four, approximate must be written. If not, I would take off a point for grading purposes. If the descriptions are good and the number here is right, approximately right, then I would, they would, a student would get a one point for each of those. So, uh, again, I said I would uh, encourage students to uh, make reasonable arguments for different dates. So, it, it'd be very reasonable to argue that the, the course towards the march towards empire began with the reign of Julius Caesar in 45 BCE rather than with, with Octavian in 27. And that would be very acceptable. Now, here's a uh, fully completed deep layered change arc for the development of the Civil War. You see we have one of the key words and phrases up here. We have from approximately mid-1850s with the description of Kansas territory as bloody battleground between free soilers and pro-slave forces to approximately the mid, -late, uh, mid to late 1860s with the struggle to establish the legal status of freed blacks by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And um, you'll notice that I've taken um, for this date here, for these dates here, the approximate dates of 15 years, I've taken the dates of 1853 and 1863, 1868 to arrive at approximate total of 15 years. And um, also you'll notice here in point three, I've gone past the, the um, ending date of the Appomattox Treaty of 1865 into the Reconstruction period even describing to describe this civil war because it can be argued that while uh, the North and South were no longer, uniformed armies of the North and South were no longer arrayed against each other in the field, um, the South was divided up into five military districts and the Union troops remained stationed there throughout the South to stop racist violence against whites and blacks. So in a very real way, the civil war had concluded um, politically on paper but socially, in many other ways, it really still continued. So, again, this uh, concept of deep layer change encourages us to think differently about the traditional dating system. Um, and I like to tell students that every time you have an urge to assign a fixed date to something, or resist it and think about causes instead. Okay, so this ends the uh, first presentation on deep layer change uh, and the drawing of this arc and diagram. Um, there is more to discuss in future videos. For example, you can put in the hash marks with specific events and dates that you find on a normal traditional straight timeline. And you can also put in uh, many deep layer changes within a larger, broader arc. Um, but those are for another video. I hope you found this interesting and potentially useful as a teaching strategy. And I'd like to hear from any instructor who uses this uh, diagram and concept in their classroom, and as well from students uh, who view this video and who anybody who's got questions about it, uh, I urge you to get in touch with me via the contact information at the end of this video. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.